afternoon and good morning uh, to everybody. And uh, really delighted uh, to be here and to follow uh, Danny's uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm going to share a screen uh, and uh, show a few slides. But let me uh, also say that um, I think very much in line with what Danny just said, globalization has a very uh, positive, important moral side to it, which is if uh, conceived in the right way, it brings the world together uh, in a set of uh, moral principles and in a peaceful way. And so we should see globalization uh, in the constructive dimension that uh, globalization means a world that is uh, integrated uh, on moral principles and uh, leading to uh, universal benefits. Uh, so if I succeed in uh, sharing the screen, uh, let me go to uh, presentation. I want to talk about globalization built on peace, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Sustainable Development. Uh, and start with, I think, the first a uh, vision of globalization under the rule of law, Isaiah 2, uh, when uh, Isaiah uh, says uh, that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the, uh, the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. And uh, so that we may walk in his path. Uh, the idea of all nations coming together, I think, was a uh, profound prophetic breakthrough. And of course, uh, Isaiah 2 continues with the wondrous words, he shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And Isaiah is right in front of the UN. Uh, it is that wall uh, that you can see in, in the lower right, but this is the founding principle of the United Nations uh, to make peace uh, by uh, the common moral vision of a truly united nations. And I think it's important to remember the UN charter in this regard, 75 years old this year, uh, where it says, we, the peoples of the United Nations, uh, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained and to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. This is, as Danny said, this is the preamble. It reminds us why we have a United Nations and why we have a globalization under a UN charter. Uh, it is to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and to promote social progress and better standards of living in larger freedom. And I think that the moral charter of the UN is what followed three years later, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it again is based on uh, the core concept that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. And they are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood, fratelli tutti. Uh, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or status. And I'm gonna say something about property uh, in this regard. Among the rights that were identified, which Danny talked about, everyone has the right to work, to free choice, to just and favorable conditions of work, to protection against unemployment. Everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work. 
to favorable remuneration uh, that gives an existence worthy of human dignity. Everyone has the right to form and join trade unions. Everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitation of work hours and periodic holidays and pay. I don't know how many governments have read this, but they all signed it. And I think that this is important. This is a universal declaration. Everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. Everyone has a right to education. So it's really remarkable that we do have a global uh, declaration of this kind as our formative uh, document. Now, when this came to be implemented in a set of covenants, and especially the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in the 1960s, the entire world signed up to this with about five exceptions. So you can see Saudi Arabia, uh, you can see uh, what is now South Sudan, Mozambique, Botswana, uh, Malaysia did not sign, all the rest of the world signed, and one country didn't ratify. That will be mine and Danny's, the United States, the country in light blue. This is very telling and very important to understand. There's one country in the world that did not ratify the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights because uh, the Senate never passed it after it was signed by the United States. And the reason is that there is a philosophy in the United States that runs against the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is a deeply embedded libertarian, Protestant uh, of a, an American version uh, form uh, of ideology. And I quote uh, one famous example of this, uh, himself not an evangelical Protestant, uh, but a, a, prof a late professor of uh, philosophy at Harvard, Robert Nozick, who wrote a famous text uh, of uh, libertarianism uh, called Anarchy, State, and Utopia, uh, very influential. And he wrote in this text that the particular right over things, meaning property, fill the space of rights, leaving no room for general rights to be in a certain material condition. And what he's saying here is that nobody has the right to be out of destitution. Nobody has the right to education. Nobody has the right to health. Nobody has the right to good jobs. Why? Because all particular things, all goods and services are already the rights of someone else. So nobody can claim I have the right to be out of poverty because that would infringe on property owners' rights. It's an extraordinary proposition. And it is directly attacking the idea of economic rights. It's a very powerful position in the United States. He goes on to say the following. The reverse theory, says Nozick, would place only such universally held general rights to something, in other words, rights to education or health, rights to achieve goals or to be in a certain material condition into its substructure so as to determine all else. To my knowledge, no serious attempt has been made to state this reverse theory. In other words, Nozick says, I understand the theory of private property but I don't understand the theory of human rights because that would undermine private property. That would be a reverse theory, he says. And he says, to my knowledge, no serious attempt has been made to state this reverse theory. The reason to his knowledge he doesn't know it is that he never read uh, the uh, church's social teachings. So he has no idea that there is a complete uh, philosophical body of thought that is precisely the reverse theory that
that gives prim primacy to the rights, not to the property. And uh, I refer to uh, Popolorum Progressio as the vivid statement of this, uh, where Pope Paul VI writes that he who has the goods in this world and sees his brother in need and closes his heart to him, how does the love of God abide in him? Everyone knows that the fathers of the church laid down the duty, the duty of the rich toward the poor in no uncertain terms. As St. Ambrose put it, you are not making a gift of what is yours to the poor man, but you are giving him back what is his. You have been appropriating things that are meant to be for the common use of everyone. The earth belongs to everyone, not to the rich. As Pope Paul says, these words indicate that the right to private property is not absolute as Nozick and the libertarians think it is. No one may appropriate surplus goods solely for his own private use when others lack the bare necessities of life. In short, as the fathers of the church and other eminent theologians tell us, the right of private property may never be exercised to the detriment of the common good. So what the church is teaching is a completely consistent theory of economic rights that say the economic rights are the common good and property rights say of the rich must bend to the common good, not the other way around. Whereas Nozick says, I have no idea how such a reverse theory could work. And uh, th this is uh, actually Pope, uh, Pope Paul VI goes on to say, when private gain and basic community needs conflict, it is for the public authorities to seek a solution to these questions with the active involvement of individual citizens and social groups. And he goes on to say, this was the 1960s of certain landed estates impede the general prosperity because they are extensive, unused or poorly used, or because they bring hardship to people's or are detrimental to the interests of the country, the common good sometimes demands their expropriation. The v Vatican II affirms this emphatically. Well, I would argue that we have such financial estates in 2020 that are exactly of this character. Uh, I give you yesterday's accounting of wealth in the world available daily online on Bloomberg.com. Yesterday, the richest person in the world had $188 billion of private wealth. That's Jeffrey Bezos of Amazon. The richest 10 people in the world, $1 trillion. The richest 50 people in the world, $2.6 trillion. The richest 100, $3.6 trillion. <laughs> and the richest 500 people in the world, $6.8 trillion. Dollars. And I didn't include it on the chart, but the richest 500 people this year since January 1 have an increase of their wealth in the midst of the global depression of $964 billion, 500 people. So if we assume a 5% payout of that 6.8 trillion, imagine it was one estate and it has a 5% annual yield, that is $340 billion a year. That's an interesting number because the IMF did a calculation <coughs> in 2019 asking how much poor countries need in order to be able to achieve economic rights in the sustainable development goals. And they did a close calculation of the costs of education, healthcare, water and sanitation, uh, basic electricity from renewable energy and so on. They asked what the poor countries can raise out of their own tax revenues and what is the financing gap. And they came up with the financing gap of $358 billion. So notice that 500 people in the world could close the financing gap of 1.7 billion people. 500 people could close the SDG financing gap of 1.7 billion people. This is how weird our world is. We have 
global ethical pillars of the Universal Declaration. They are instantiated in the Sustainable Development Goals. They reflect the social teachings of the church that uh, everybody has basic human rights to health, education, livelihoods, social protection, because those are core for human dignity and there is universality of human dignity. It turns out that in order to realize those rights, there is a financial need. If the poor people were in the same country as the rich people, that would be an internal transfer problem. It happens that most of the rich people are in rich countries and most of the poor people are in poor and middle income countries, though not entirely. We still have the shocking and glaring uh, disaster of poverty in the United States, a very rich country. But mostly this is at an international scale. And globalization should address this as a global community bound together by global principles. Finally, just to say, uh, yesterday the question arose of how uh, our various objectives relate to well-being uh, and to human thriving. And uh, this is just a, a scatter plot from a, a paper that I'm uh, publishing uh, now with the co-author uh, Jan Manuel Genev. Uh, who, where we note that pursuing the SDGs is higher score on SDG achievement is highly correlated with a higher score on subjective well-being, in other words, subjective measures of happiness. And the countries that are closest to achieving sustainable development in its holistic framework, like Denmark, Finland, Sweden, are the countries that rank highest in happiness. It's good news. If we follow through on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, not only will we realize human rights, but we will realize human thriving. And so just to conclude, in my view of globalization, the core pillars of globalization are first the commitment to the common good. Second is the core teaching of the church, the universal destination of goods, that private property rights are subordinate to human dignity. Third is care for the creation. And fourth is the fundamental notion that we do this not only out of deontological uh, principles, though that might be enough, but also under our own well being, that we need to live in a society we need to live with others. And that's the message of Fratelli Tutti. So I will uh, pause there and thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Jeff. It was a, a very, very, very important speech. Of course, uh, very in the line of the popes and, and also in the goals, develop goals. Con congratulations. You are the Capability to synthesize things that the other people <laughs> is possible to put together. Congratulations, Dave. It's very important for our discussion.